Hello friends, come on into my kitchen today while I talk about 10 methods of food preservation. And let's jump right into it. There are some methods that we all are familiar with and that would be freezing. I had potatoes, peppers and onions available in the fall. So I, this is from December. I diced these up and blanched the, uh, the potatoes. They have to be partly um, dunked in hot water and then dunked in cold water to help the enzymes that continue to, to um, ripen them. You want to uh, dunk them so that they freeze better uh, and it keeps the texture, keeps some products from going woody. So freezing we're very familiar with and uh, we often you know, we all have, a most of us have a refrigerator with a, a freezer compartment attached. Uh, freezing is something that's very common and familiar. So uh, I have my, my pork chops and my fruit and vegetables and, you know, all, of, all kinds of things in the freezer. Number two will be dry storage. That would be a bag of flour, a bag of rice, a bag of oatmeal, um, your salt, sugar, all of those things that we need to keep dry. They can be stored in mason jars, they can be stored in the bags they come in, but you have more risk of pest penetration, mice and, and bugs and stuff getting into them if you uh, leave them in the bag. So putting them in a airtight container like uh, a glass jar or um, a, a, fi a, a five gallon bucket with a tight lid on it, those are good dry storage methods. Number three involves both of these. Number three is my vacuum sealer. Yes, you can use that to preserve your food. Like putting dry storage in the bag, in the jars, we can attach the hose and vacuum the air out of this and then it will keep that sealed for much longer and it's not just screwed on tight, it's actually vacuum sealed so there's no oxygen in there. You can put uh, oxygen absorbers in there as well. Uh, I never have and my food keeps for a couple of years. If you wanted longer than that, you would use the oxygen absorbers or if you're in a humid environment, you'd want to use the oxygen absorbers. So vacuum sealing, this lid or this attachment came with my uh, vacuum sealer and uh, by vacuum sealing the meat packages, these came from my friend down the road and um, they're wrapped in butcher paper, but then we also vacuum sealed them. That will help to protect them a little longer in the freezer and protect them from freezer burn. The butcher paper doesn't protect them very well, but the plastic gives it an extra layer. Why might we want to preserve our food? Well, with the way prices are going right now, you might want to buy that rice that's on for a bargain price or that oatmeal that's on for a bargain price or even that meat that you know is real meat <laughs> and uh, preserve it, put it away, and uh, know that that price is pretty much frozen in your house so that in your pantry so that you're not paying the ridiculously high prices that are out there right now another reason may be that you like to have some food security uh, i don't like to be stuck in the winter with you know two feet of snow and uh suddenly there's no no, let, no, no food in the house. Well, we have lots of food in the house. There's always enough for at least a month here. And uh, I've been doing that for years and years and years. My whole adult life, I have kept a 30-day supply of food in the, in the house. It just felt like it was my job as a mother to make sure my children had food. And uh, that's a hard thing to shake. Now that we're empty nesters, I still want to make sure that there's enough food in the house to feed my husband and I. And uh, I'm still feeding my kids whenever they come by or if I go to their place I, I try to take some canned food to some some pantry goods to them. Another reason you might want to know about for food preservation and, and become skilled at food preservation is if you want to keep a prepper pantry for that disaster that you know some people feel that there is a disaster coming, whether it is social, whether it is economic, whether it is medical, whether it is uh, like we've just been through in the past few years, or whether it is, you know, civil unrest, social, whatever the situation is, maybe we're going to have EMT and uh, solar flares knock out all of our hydro and electronics, and now we have, you know, there's lots of scenarios. Um, me, I just prefer to have 30 days worth of food in my pantry so that if we have an economic upset within the house 
or if we have a sickness within our house, <laughs> then, you know, or for some reason we have to quarantine again, then I know that we are, we have 30 days worth of food, at least 30 days worth of food. It's just my comfort level. Number four on the uh, on the list today is dehydrating. Now this is not the top top of the line dehydrator. This is entry level, and most people would be able to afford this, I would think. Um, and it's a way to preserve your fresh produce. And it doesn't matter if it's fresh from your garden or if it's fresh from the grocery store. You can preserve goods this way. I've used it to preserve my mint out of my garden, so I have mint tea all winter long. I've used it to preserve apples from the grocery store so we have see so we have apples to put in our oatmeal or to uh, just enjoy as a little snack you can cut them in any way you want and this one this one is peppers and onions these are out of our garden and I use those I can throw those in tomato sauce and sit it on the stove and let it simmer and uh, they're fresh to go you know what else we use these for my husband likes to go backcountry camping, canoe camping, and uh, he can take his food with him, very lightweight, and already uh, all he has to do is simmer it for five minutes and then he's got his lunch. I will have Amazon links in the description down below for all of these items I'm showing you. We, I, we are Amazon affiliates and any purchases you make through our links, whether it's these items or something else, helps to support our channel we get a tiny commission off of that that doesn't affect your pricing at all your price is the same whether you go directly to amazon yourself or whether you go through our links this is method number five you can take your dried goods and preserve them in oil so this is yarrow leaf and this is good for your skin and this one is uh, sun-dried tomatoes or dehydrated tomatoes with peppers and onions and such in there and I can put that right in a salad or I can put them in my uh, my spaghetti sauce or anything that I'm cooking that I want to have sliced tomatoes let's see there we go can you see how beautiful that is so those are in olive oil now they won't keep for a long long time but uh, I'd probably give them a year I do have some calendula blossoms in oil in my apothecary shelf and I will use that oil with beeswax and coconut oil to make um, balms and hand lotions and chapsticks and all kinds of um, healing ointments that I would make. Method number six is water bath canning. So this is just a large pot with a rack in the bottom. Any pot can be used to do water bath canning as long as you can put an inch of water over top of your jars. So just measure your pots at home and see if you have one deep enough. I have a stock pot that works well. But this one works well to fit more jars in a whole batch at once. Sometimes two batches, depends on what you're making. Water bath canning is for low acid foods. So they can be your sugary jams, they can be your pickles that are made with vinegar. They can be your salsa that has added lemon juice in it to make it more, more, um, more acidic. And uh, you can find recipes all over the place to use water bath canning. I like the Bernardin Complete Book of Home Preserving. It has all kinds of recipes for water bath canning or pressure canning. And that's next, the pressure bath, or the pressure canner. Pressure canning is for the high protein foods and low acid foods. So high protein is your meat and beans. Yes, I can can beef, chicken, fish, whatever protein I want. Just follow the instructions in the book and uh, I can have pressure canned beef. So I have beef ready to go. If we have a power failure, I don't have to cook this. I just warm it up and then we have beef. Vegetables like potatoes, corn, carrots, green beans, whatever vegetables you like, you can pressure can them as well. And that'll keep them on the shelf stable instead of having them growing eyes or going wilty in your fridge. That keeps them stable for up to two years, I would say. They suggest a year, but uh, it's easily to go a year and a half. And I know families that consume their canned goods, their pressure canned goods, for years, five years afterwards common practice would say a year 18 months I also make vegetable broth chicken broth um, my tomato juice when I'm making my tomato sauce 
I save the juice and I can that all up in my pressure canner and uh, it keeps it healthy, safe, prevents botulism and uh, because you're following pra uh, safe practices. There are methods out there that are called rebel canning and uh, they're they're following a different method. They're following older style methods. I'm not going to say that they're wrong or that their methods will fail, but they sometimes have to boil their things for three hours. Who has three hours to leave a pot on the stove? Um, and then still, I don't trust it myself. I would rather know it was brought to a, a suitable temperature to kill the bacteria and uh, I'm not putting my family at risk. Make your own decisions on that one. Number eight is fermenting. Lots of foods have been fermented for all of millennia. People would store their uh, their goat's milk in a, 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 a wine skin, more or less, and uh, then it would ferment and because it was at a certain temperature and it had a certain amount of bacteria left inside the, the wine skin or the, the stomach liner bag from the last time it was used. And uh, the milk would ferment they would then have yogurt or kefir. This is my homemade yogurt. Two ingredients. I have a recipe video. I will link that below so you can look at that. Another thing that may be commonly known lately is uh, the past few years is kombucha. You can buy this commercially in the stores now. This one is one I've done myself and I actually haven't done it for a while, but I do have to start some up soon. I have a request for some for May 4th, so I need to have that, I need to work that process. Along with kombucha and yogurt, you can make sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, uh, fermented carrots, uh, fermented pickles, all kinds of things that you could ferment with that method. Um, I think it's called lacto-fermentation. I haven't done it myself. I have a problem with fermented goods, so I just do the minimum that I can get away with. I can't physically show you number nine because it's freeze drying. I don't have any freeze dried products in my house at the moment and we don't own a freeze dryer. If Harvest Right would like to send me one, yes please, <laughs> I will accept one. Um, I, uh, I think that they're fantastic. All of the ideas and uh, different foods people have done with them, all kinds of things like that. I would love to have a freeze dryer. I think it would change our world here in, the, in our house. My husband and I are approaching retirement years and because we are the age that we are, gardening is going to be more difficult. And what if we downsize and move into town again? It would be nice to know that we were able to freeze dry our farm fresh eggs. It would be nice to know that that food sitting on that shelf is organically grown and it didn't come from the store. We grew it ourselves, so tomatoes and eggs and all of our peppers and onions and vegetables and all of the wonderful things that we could freeze dry and store for up to 25 years. Getting into freeze drying can pre be pretty expensive. Here in Ontario, a medium size Harvest Right freeze dryer costs about $3,600, maybe $3,700 $3, now. And um, that's a little bit out of our budget right this moment, but uh, it's definitely something I want to do and it's something I would like to have to preserve our, our current bounty and our current abilities to preserve into our future. Of course I'd be making videos to share with all of you. Here's number 10. Number 10 is smoking. So you, pr you may know someone who has a smoker. You may have heard of someone who has a smoker. You may have had, you've probably had smoked bacon, smoked salmon, smoked uh, ham, all kinds of methods that are used for smoking. And um, we haven't practiced it here. My husband is interested in it, but uh, it's something yet to be discovered. We've only been on our homestead for two full years. We're approaching our, our third summer now, and we moved in in November, so this is approaching our third summer. And uh, a smoker is something that we are, are considering, and um, it's not as dear as, not as costly as a freeze dryer, but it is another method of, of preserving your food and mostly flavoring your food. Most foods that you smoke these days, you still have to um, refrigerate after they've been smoked, but it does help them last in the refrigerator much, much longer. And here's a bonus one, number 11, salting. Um, we may think of beef jerky as being salted. 
although it is soaked in a salty brine, it is dehydrated. Uh, something else that's salted is salt cod. And salt cod, once it's prepared, it can sit on the shelf in a cool, dark space for a long time. On, a, on the shelf, it doesn't have to be refrigerated. It can just sit on the shelf for a long, long time. Uh, salt cod is well known on the east coast of Canada and uh, mostly some of the old timers. I've heard about it when I, you know, from the old timers in my life. And uh, all of those uh, folks have their, can have their salt cod because it just doesn't tickle my fancy, let's say. <laughs> I'm not interested in even trying salted fish. A lot of the old timers and East Coast families will know more about uh, salt and salt cod and salt curing than I do. And uh, I'll leave that for someone else to explain, but that's another, that's an 11th method of food preservation that I can share with you today. That's it. We have 11 different methods and uh, let me know which ones you use. Let me know which methods you commonly have in your house or which ones you want to develop the skills for. Thanks for hanging out with me today, guys. I will see you next time.